evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Board of Education regular meeting for September. Ms. Hibbs, would you call the roll? Dr. Daniels. Here. Mrs. Felter. Here. Mrs. Martin. Here. Mr. McCune. Here. Mr. Parker. Here. Mr. Poland. Here. Mr. Shear. Here. Would everyone please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome everyone, thank you for being here. We're going to proceed with item 2.01, uh, presentation on our Olathe Latino Coalition. Dr. Bankowski, are you leading the presentation here? I'm leading the presentation. Uh, as you can see from the slide, there's really three of us that have been involved in uh, the Latino Coalition on the Education Subcommittee. Uh, Dr. Heinen is going to be here, and she's going to look supportive. And I'm going to take us through the slides. <laughs> Uh, uh, Tabitha Davis was not able to be here this evening unless she pops in surprisingly, uh, but she wasn't able to be here this evening. Uh, last, the Olathe Latino Coalition, which you may have heard of in the city and being discussed throughout the city of Olathe, uh, began in the fall of 2011-12 and had the opportunity to uh, sit in on the first couple of meetings just to kind of get a flavor of what was in mind. And it took us a while to kind of get started, but we were an outgrowth of a conversation that really Really some pastors had with Mayor Mike Copeland uh, and so that's kind of where that discussion came from and then that was not a discussion with me but at some point I had an opportunity to join the group uh, the purpose was really kind of a focus off of a Kansas City article that you might have uh, read at the time I think it was in 2007 uh, was that Olathe was identified as a welcoming community and that Olathe excelled when it came to welcoming Latino and Hispanic individuals and so out of that, the, the mayor had talked about that he would like uh, Olathe to be a community that is even more welcoming to Hispanic and Latino individuals. And so that was kind of the purpose that was stated. Uh, certainly also our purpose was to kind of take a look at this area and bring forth some doable recommendations uh, put for potential uh, implement implementation in the city. So we kind of started with this concept, a small group of individuals. Uh, there were six identified uh, subcommittees, if you will, or strands that the Olathe Latino Coalition was supposed to take a look at. And of course, you can see everything from housing and community to local government and justice. And of course, I put at the top, I uh, had control of the pen, education. Uh, and that was one of the six uh, uh, strands that was being looked at. Uh, there was uh, every uh, subcommittee or area, area had a, uh, an individual that, or two or three that were identified kind of as the leads. And we had an opportunity to work with Hector Silva and Tom Basford uh, from Significant Matters. In fact, uh, Mr. Basford is here this evening and we'd like to welcome him. He helped facilitate uh, our uh, opportunities that we had as the Olathe Latino Coalition and helped to kind of brainstorm on where we were going. Uh, so he gave some direction. You can see the un other individuals on there uh, it, representing the Olathe Medical Center uh, representing some of the area community churches, so uh, in different individuals that were there. As a uh, reason we uh, had taken a look at this, and I think the reason Mayor Mike had brought this forward was, of course, that as our population was growing as a city, we are also having an increase in our Latino population, and these were figures that were provided to us at that time as we started and that our Latino population um, was very diverse, everything from recent immigrants that had come to the area to those uh, from uh, Mexico to Latin America, different areas, and to longtime residents. It was certainly a growing population in the school district, and uh, it seemed the right thing to do, and I think that's why it was brought forth by the mayor and the pastors that were discussing at that time. As I said, uh, we had an opportunity to look at the education portion of that, uh, and it's uh, so fitting because obviously that is our mission is to educate students. Uh, one of the things that we did is we looked at what were the areas that we were going to look at 
when we looked at uh, the Hispanic Latino population. And, and so we looked at three areas that, to begin with. Early childhood education, we looked at K-12 education, we looked at post-secondary education, as well as kind of pulling all that together. Uh, so we had four sessions that we uh, had, were involved in. Uh, these were the facilitators, Dr. Heinen and myself from the school district, and as I said, Tabitha Davis from N MNU had been recommended because she was also on the Human Relations Commission uh, for the city, as well as she's certainly an important person in Mid-America. We had over 65 individuals, if you can believe it, that came to four sessions right here in this room, most of them, and uh, we had everything from local government that was represented, Johnson County Health Department that was working with early childhood, we had higher education, JCCC, MNU, a KU, we had ESU, all represented in the uh, group, local partners like the YMCA, the Public Library, El Centro, Center of Grace, and of course, the Olathe School District was represented as we talked about education. We had an opportunity to learn. Uh, we did some reflection on what we had learned. We asked questions. We looked at what some of our strengths were, what are some of our benefits were right now, what are maybe some gaps or areas that we want to strengthen. And then we did some prioritizing. We did the old dot thing on a chart uh, paper. We came up with some action areas, and uh, you can see the three action areas that we came up with uh, from early childhood, increasing our early childhood opportunities for Hispanic and Latino students. Uh, certainly, we looked at the K-12 education, uh, increasing Hispanic Latino students' involvement, uh, both after school and during school, and opportunities for leadership. That was an area that came forth from our group that we thought that would help strengthen uh, what we were already providing for our students. And again, many, many many strengths were identified. And then post-secondary, uh, interagency awareness, just an opportunity to get together and talk because there's an awful lot happening at different institutions like JCCC, like MNU, that we weren't aware of as a collective whole, and really increasing that college-going culture, and we know that has to start so young. So right now we have action plan groups that are identified in these particular areas. We have facilitators and leaders. And we hope that at the end of the school year, we can say, gosh, we did this, and we did this, and we did this. Uh, we know that um, many people are doing this on top of the uh, busy plates they already have uh, going in their regular positions. So it's an opportunity to get together and hopefully move something forward. Uh, so that's kind of where we were on the education portion. The Latino Coalition as a whole, you might remember there were six areas. All six areas provided uh, action steps for their areas. We all worked independently of each other. Uh, so the education brought forth what we thought of those 65 individuals that met and kind of tried to look at and prioritize all those many strengths, but also the areas that we could strengthen and, and uh, work on. And then now the entire Olathe Latino Coalition, under the direction of Tom Basford and Hector uh, Silva, are putting together, have put together a report which they've given to the city manager who's looking that over and then uh, next step to, uh, somehow the mayor and how that process goes. There might be some next steps about the, the Latino coalition, the structure may change, but we have had at least an influence from the educational perspective. And of course, we are already putting a lot of energy and time into helping all our students be successful including our Hispanic Latino students. I do have a couple of representatives from the committee of those 65 individuals that are here this evening, so I wondered if they just might stand as well as Tom, just so we could recognize the efforts they put forth on the evening meetings that we had. Hey, thank you. Gives you a little glimmer to uh, know how the education portion was participating in moving forward something uh, that we know is good for kids, and of course, that's what we're all about. So, with that, Dr. Heinen or myself would stand for questions. Board members? On the action plans, there, the uh, K through 12 and post secondary uh, sounds like a good description of the AVID program. Uh, have we, are we doing anything? I mean, a little more detail of what our plans are. That's a pretty broad uh, statement. These, there. Yes, these are pretty broad goal statements yet. The sub little the sub subcommittees uh, haven't gotten together through all of them yet to outline what are our two or three steps. 
I heard very much from the post-secondary group of how they were going to be involving the AVID teachers and the students that are in the AVID program. Because if we're going to create a college-going culture, isn't that a wonderful place to begin with that? And so we already have many things going on in that area. I think one thing that we found out in all of our studies is there's so much already happening in this particular area and already strength in the AVID program was mentioned. We had a conversation about that. We had data about that. Uh, so we just need to build on the successes that we have had. And so the AVID program will definitely be part of that. Another area, for example, with Erica Razo is uh, works with our ELL students, our Hispanic Latino students, and works on student leadership. And one of the thoughts was we should clone him and we should have more. But really, as we got to it, we just need to deploy lots of different individuals that have the opportunity to work on student leadership. So he's helping with some others to facilitate that K-12 group to work on student <coughs> leadership. Uh, so we're building on all those things that we already have going. Good point, Mr. Paul. I had a comment or a question, I guess, about the early childhood experiences. I think you and I talked about this quite a while ago, and it was my understanding that perhaps um, clearly, we're not in a position to be able to educate every preschooler, although I, I would be my love that we would, um, but that we would make our curricular expectations for kindergarten known to those other agencies, those other churches and other entities doing preschool in, in this school district so that they would be aware as they developed their own curriculum. Is that correct? Yes, and we're also working on helping uh, daycare centers or home care providers that are working predominantly with Hispanic Latino students. And in fact, uh, uh, Nancy and Isabel have been helping with some training and some focus areas and helping to, to bridge that gap. You're so correct. We, uh, one of the things the, the group would like to have put a priority stars on is to provide more opportunities for early childhood education. But we have some novel things happening. We have a church that is giving some slots for early childhood programs to Hispanic Latino students at one of our elementary school and they're paying scholarships for those kids to, to be able to go. So I, I think we'll, we'll be able to envelope some really wonderful things, but it's going to take some time. And we also know that we have to work within the reality of the parameters that we have. But our goal is to help students to be ready to learn and have some prior experiences before they come into school. Other comments or questions? You Thank you for your work. We appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. We'll be moving on now to item 2.02, .02, our student learning results. Um, Ms. Matthew and Dr. Banikowski. Fabulous. To get data takes a lot of people to have, make that happen. It certainly takes the students to participate in taking those exams or assessments. It certainly takes teachers to prepare them. It takes curriculum individuals to make sure we're doing uh, a good curriculum that's aligned with the assessments they're going to take. It takes the administrators to help motivate students, set up the schedule. It takes a lot of people, and of course the parents, to feed the kids a very good breakfast the day that they're going to have an <laughs> assessment. So it takes a lot of individuals to, to, to work on that. And you know, you think about it, why do we do all this data? Why do we collect data? I had an opportunity to speak with a gentleman that's working on his doctorate, and he's one of our uh, educators from Olathe Northwest just today. And I talked about, you know, we are thinking the data is kind of important in the Olathe Public Schools. We believe that data should be looked at, it should be monitored, and we should adjust if that data tells us we need to do something different or if that data tells us we need to continue to build on something that's already in place. We're very fortunate this evening we're going to have an opportunity to hear about some of those data learning results of the Kansas Reading and the Kansas Math Achievement and Assessment. But we're also going to hear a little bit about how the, ch the program is changing for the way schools are accredited in the state of Kansas. And uh, we're very fortunate to hear about that, as well as we always need to celebrate the many successes that we have. 
Mary Matha, we're very pleased, you know, as our Director of Assessment and School Improvement, has an opportunity to pull all that work together uh, and to help us to take a look at that achievement data and look at that data that we have available and to monitor and adjust as we go along. So she's going to give us a little a glimmer of that as well as some of the new accountability system in the state of Kansas. So I'll turn this over to Mary. Thank you. As we start tonight, we will um, focus a little bit on the new accountability and we'll intertwine the two with our results. Um, as we, in the past, I would be standing up here and I would be sharing with you our AYP results or our adequate yearly progress. And I'm going to share with you tonight that that language is gone. So we're going to learn some new language. We're going to learn some API and we're going to learn some other acronyms that um, I have to tell you honestly, I, as I continue to even train principals and others on, they've seen it many times and they're still like, I still don't get it. So tonight I'm going to share a lot of information that you may not get right away, but I think it's important that we begin the conversation to see the changes that are happening at the state. Um, when In the past, when we looked at our Kansas assessment scores, we looked at Kansas reading and math scores and we typically just looked at the the percentage of students that were proficient or higher and then we also looked at and measured that to a state target the state would say 92.8 percent of your students have to be proficient or higher and next year 94 and so on with the ultimate goal by 14 15 of having 100 percent of our students proficient or higher well, the new system looks different, and it looks different because of the Kansas waiver. In 2012, Kansas sought a waiver from our narrow accountability system <clears throat> of just having to be set to percent proficient or higher and held to that same target. What they've done now is they've allowed for multiple ways for us to um, make, so to speak, in our old language of AYP. So tonight when we talk, remember the targets themselves are gone. Each district and each school has their own target. So as a district, our, dis our target is different than our neighboring districts. They're different from others across the state because those targets are based specifically on our data and on the new system. In the old way, we talked a lot about thinking about if we made AYP and how do we make it on AYP. The new language really is going to talk, is I'm going to talk about annual measurable objectives. And we refer to them as AMOs. Okay? And the nice part about the new system right now is instead of having that one way we could make it, we now have four ways we can make it, so to speak. And those happen to be with our AMOs. There are four different achievement AMOs, or annual measurable objectives. They are improving achievement, reducing the percentage of students who are non-proficient, being able to decrease the gap between a high scoring group and a low scoring group, and then also being able to show growth. And I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail about what each of those four are so that you can see um, how data is measured. The data I'm sharing tonight is preliminary, and there are a couple of pieces of data tonight that we still don't have back from the state, but we have a good idea of where we're falling. Two old way things were participation and graduation. We still had to have students participate on the state assessment in the old system and in the new, and we still have to meet a set graduation rate. Attendance was one piece that was part of the past that they still provide us and they still want us to look at as part of QPA. So I'm sharing that with you tonight so that you can at least see our attendance rates continue to be uh, comparable to uh, the past five years. We still continue to um, kind of meet that mark of having 95% or greater. Um, the high school graduation rate, which is part of the new system and part of the old, what I want to point out for you there is graduation rates always run a year behind. So when it says 2012 graduates, that's what we're looking at. And that's where it's really kind of tricky because you would think, well, surely they've got those 2013 kids figured out by now. Well, they don't because some kids go back and they finish if they hadn't finished with the rest of their peers, they'll finish over the summer. And so some of that data and reporting won't come out until later. 
later. But we can see that our graduation rate for this past, uh, for our 2012 graduates was a 92.9, which again is an increase. In 2010, when I stood here, we talked a little bit about how the state changed the way they reported it, and we knew that that was a little confusing because our scores um, fluctuated. But you can see now, based on the new reporting and the way things are working, we still have a great number of our, our uh, graduation rate. We exceed that state goal of 80%. When we look at our new ways, and I'm going to talk a little bit about those AMOs, I'm going to talk first about improving achievement. Because the first thing uh, the state says is you need to improve achievement in your district in both reading and math. There are two ways that you, uh, or two factors that are considered within this. The first is what's called an assessment performance index, or an API score. That API score it comes up with basically where students score on the assessment. So if five students score in an exemplary category, a school or a district would get 5,000 points. If 20 kids, we'd have 20,000 points and so on. And they, uh, for exceed standards, you can see you would get 750 points for a student. And you can see that we don't receive any points if students score in the academic learning category. What the state does to create the API score is they look at those kids, how many score in each, and they come up with their number by dividing it by the total number of students. Now that's kind of one of those little number nerdy things that I don't expect you to remember, but just know that an API score comes from the performance levels and the number of kids in each. The second part of the achievement piece that's important is for us to look at the percentage of students that score below proficient. Both of those factors have to play together. So let's look at data and kind of in a similar fashion to what we would have looked at in the past. In the past, you would have seen a focus on those, uh, the bar graph and you would see each of those scores where we would have talked last year about how we had 94.3% of our students proficient or higher. We would have talked about how the uh, target we had to make, we exceeded that target. That target is gone now, but we now have to look at in terms the percent below proficient. So when we look at our percent below proficient, and I gave you two years of data just to look at for comparison purposes because I think it's a good way to kind of help understand the system, you'll see although our percent below proficient increased for this most recent year, there actually was a slight change in the test. Now, we've tested on the 2003 standards, but what the state did is in order to get us to shift to implement our college and career ready standards or to implement our new curriculum, they said, we're going to take only two thirds of your existing test and kids are going to take it. And we're gonna load the rest of that test with new standards that were college and career ready. They're not going to count, but they're going to be in there. So in the past, the test we would have compared test to test really was basically the same but a third of it was different. And so that's where I think you'll see that we see that decrease, or in, in this case, an increase. We have more students scoring below proficient. That's a trend they saw statewide. It's a trend um, others have seen. When we look back to looking at this achievement AMO, there's those two factors. So what we have to look at, what were our API points, and what was our percent below proficient? In our case, we had 769 API points in the 2012-13 school year. What you'll see in terms of looking at that, I provided for you also the Kansas API score because I think it's important for us to gauge how we um, mark, at least compared to the state in this first round of data. You can see our percent below proficient was 6.29. What you see on the last column is now our district target. So instead of all of us having the same target to meet, our target now is next year, or this year I guess we should say, we need to have 774 API points in reading and we need to reduce our percent below proficient to lower than 5%. Now keeping that in mind, the state also determined that there were four performance level categories for schools meaning schools were identified as high need schools. If you were a high need school or a high need district, you would have fewer than 635 API points and you'd have more than 15% below proficient. We know that's not us. On the opposite end is modeling. Modeling means you have an API score greater than 757. That part is us, 
in reading. We had more than 757 API points, but you have to have less than 5% of your students scoring below proficient. And because of that, it throws us as a district into the label of a transitioning district or a level three district. Now, when we look at that, we can see how very close we are to being what's called a modeling district. And I show there for you the comparison again of how Kansas also scored. So in reading, when we look at reading achievement, we can see right now that we're doing fine. We're in a transitioning level. Um, we're very close to that modeling level as a district. Um, and we, we know then that's a place where we need to continue to work. But we have basically, I think, some good things to celebrate there. If we look at math, we can look at it in that same um, way. We can look at the percentage of students scoring below proficient. We can look at our scores in terms of our API points. In mathematics, we would have 737 API points for this most current year that we just assessed. You can see what our target is. We want to have 742 API points by the end of the year. And our goal is to reduce to below 6%. So each district has their own target. Same as all of our buildings. All of our buildings have their own targets as well. When we look, and we look at where we fall in terms of math, the reason I distinguish the difference for you is what you'll notice uh, in terms of the greater than. You recall in reading I said for an API score, I gave you that, but I also said we had to have a high need school would be, or a high need district would be greater than 15%. In math, it's greater than 19%. So math and reading are two different formulas, two different looks, two different numbering system. So if you have more than 19%, then you would be a high need category. You can see the modeling end. When I shared reading, it was less than 5%. You can see in math, it's less than 6%. So when we look at where we fall in terms of math, we become a transitioning district also in math. We had 737 API points in math. We had 8.65% of our students below proficient. We fall within that category of transitioning. So both reading and math, when we look at achievement, we're a transitioning uh, district in terms of the new language uh, for AMOs. So achievement is one AMO, okay? There are three more. Well, let's keep going. I know you're going to have questions, but bear with me. I know hopefully we'll, you'll still have questions in a month, because I still have questions sometimes. We looked at before the percentage of students that scored below proficient. We looked at in reading, there was 6.29% below proficient. In math, there was 8.65. The goal for the second AMO to, is to reduce the percentage or the, non, the number of students that are non-proficient. In essence, we have to take 6.29%. We have to cut it in half by the 2017-18 school year to 3.145. It's a little bit longer target that we have to reach. It's um, over a six year time period. Same for math, you can see 8.65 this year, we have to cut in half by 4.325 is what our target would be. Interestingly enough, the state will give us yearly targets that we have to benchmark again as well. But the ultimate goal for reducing the non-proficient is over a six year time period, reduce that in half. Same goes for all of our schools. They have six years to reduce in half. So that's the second AMO. The third AMO has, is called reducing the gap. And this is the one where I think when we think about it, it makes you go, really? Because what the state has done with this uh, annual measurable objective is they are taking the state's highest performing group, they are comparing them to a district or a building's lowest performing group. And lowest performing 30% is really what it is. And they're saying, what is the gap between the state's highest and the district's lowest, or the state's highest and a building's lowest? Okay? Mary, when you say the state's highest, you're talking about the state district with the highest? It's or the not, state it, that's a great question. It is the state's highest mean or average for a, a particular group. So if their highest performing group, say, was ELL students, oh, that's okay. where that score would come from. So it's their highest performing group. Okay. Okay. 
When we look at the data a little bit more closely, you'll see I haven't provided this year's data because this year's data actually rolled out about five o'clock today, a little bit additional piece. But I'm gonna share with you the example of what we see and kind of what we need to, to look at. Remember if we're looking at the state's highest and in my uh, one that I show you, the state's highest is 734 API points. You can see as a district, we had in reading 472 API points for our lowest performing group, or our lowest 30%. And when I say lowest group, I can't identify that group because it truly is our lowest 30% of our kids, the lowest scoring group, okay? And that's really how, um, which is kind of tricky with this piece. The goal is we need to gain 22 API points for that lowest performing group within six years. Another way to look at it is if we ever get to 500, which we will, when we get to 500, then you don't have to worry about this one because you have already achieved this AMO. So you can see in my example, this shows you data um, a little bit, I think in terms of where we're headed with this. Math is the same uh, example. The state's highest was a 719. Our, our lowest group was a 448, and you can see we have to gain 23 API points. And so that's our target, is to gain that 23. Mary, when you say the group has to gain 22 points, mm -hmm. um, that group changes every year, correct? It does, it's not yes. this, We're not tracking that same group of students for the next five years. It's that's correct. Okay. We're looking at different groups of kids every year, oh, and that does become a little <laughs> tricky. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and that's where I think when we look at this one, it is um, where we have to be really cognizant as a district and as buildings who are kids that are struggling and making sure that we're doing everything we can to make sure they're achieving. So, so that is our third AMO, and our last one has to do with growth. The goal for growth is, is that a school would be within the top half of all distributions for growth. Meaning, you can see on my little bar or my little graph, you can see my arrow pointing to that top half. Uh, as a district, we are in that top half for both reading and math. And that's another piece that just came out today. We were in the top half with our data last year as we looked at it, but we are again this year. And that's a piece yet that will, st school data hasn't been released yet for that, so we'll have to continue to look at that. But the goal is, is to be in the top half or in that top quadrant or square, meaning be in that, that top medium of all schools. So in terms of growth right now as a district, we're where we wanna be and where we need to be. So with all that said, there are those four AMOs. There was the achievement, closing the gap, okay? Looking at the, the reduction of non-proficient and then growth. There are some other changes that the state has made in relationship to their accountability system. In the past, we would share with you schools that have achieved a standard of excellence. Uh, they are no longer identifying schools as standard of excellence. I'm sure they'll come up with something in the future, but right now, that's off the table. In the terms of our Title I world, um, Title I identifies three types of schools, a reward school, a priority school, and a focus. We talked to you last year about Indian Trail because they were identified as a reward school. Um, we have not received any lists yet of reward or of focus or priority schools. We do not have any schools that are focus or priority schools. Those have to be schools that are the bottom 33 or the bottom 66 or the bottom 99 schools in the state. We have no schools on that list, nor do we have any jeopardy of having schools on that list based on our current assessments. And so we'll come back to you if we hear any word on reward schools. We don't anticipate hearing any news until probably November. The original release of state data was supposed to be October. We've now heard as of this week they'll move it uh, to November at least that's kind of the direction they're headed there are some other changes that you need to be aware of and you know for a case stater it's really hard to put that big old Jayhawk on there but I did um, <laughs> this year our state assessment system that we've had in the past has run through CETE or KU um, they are um, going to continue to do that but this year we will give a totally brand new assessment whereas last year we only gave a third new this year the entire test will be new. It will be called a transition assessment. The goal is to uh, 
get schools and districts uh, prepared as we implement uh, our college and career ready standards. Um, they, uh, the contractor is KU. Past this year, what we know about our assessments is we don't know. Um, it is still up in the air. We anticipate the 14-15 school year that the state board will make a decision in November. As part of that decision, they have various items on the table. They have what's called Smarter Balanced. It's an assessment consortium that currently Kansas is part of. Um, they also have ACT on the table. There's a group that would like to see us move to having ACT, and ACT now has, um, they have a whole suite of assessments. They have Aspire at the uh, elementary level, and we already give Explore and Plan and ACT. So um, if that's uh, the direction the state moves, that's another option. And then the little bitty Jayhawk on this side is that's still an option is for KU to continue to be um, our state provider. I think there's many factors at play. The state is currently bringing in different uh, teams and groups of people across the field asking for input, and hopefully we'll know more in November uh, regarding the future of our state assessments. But for the next two years, we really will see, um, I, I think it's gonna be a little roller coaster with what we see in terms of our data. They'll have to do new cut scores, they'll have to do new performance levels. And so um, I, I always tell people, let's not panic yet, we don't know. Um, but what we don't know sometimes is okay. We'll just go with the flow and, and make it work. Um, so some final notes. With our implementation of college and career ready standards and those new assessments, we know there's a lot of changes to follow. Um, you'll get to hear about a lot of those. We'll bring those back to you. Again, official release probably November. And then lastly, uh, we will come back to you in October with just a look at our high school data and how that looks um, for different areas. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have over this kind of meaty topic tonight that um, can be a little overwhelming. So happy to answer any questions. Well, I have one question. So it appears to me, and help me if I'm not processing this correctly, that the focus of comparison then is not our district against another district, but it's an internal comparison of changes that or performance that we make within our own buildings. Absolutely. But then is there a mechanism for external comparison? I mean, other than saying you're in the group of districts that met their goal. I mean, other than that, there's not really no. a other mechanism than... anymore. So it's focusing more internally on performance. Absolutely. And I think depending on what happens with the new assessments, if we go with, for example, Smarter Balance, um, there might be comparisons mm -hmm. of other mm -hmm. states, of other um, benchmarks to look at. But until we know what that looks like, we, we just don't know. Okay. But at this point, it is an internal comparison. Okay. Other comments or questions for board members? Yeah. Um, great presentation. Thanks. Um, I think it's going to take all of us a long time to let yes. this settle in and, mm -hmm. and kind of figure it all out. So it my is. question might be uh, really basic. That's okay. The way I understand it, we made it yes. this year yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. based on being in the top 50%. That's correct. That's one way we made it. Was there another way we made it? We made it with achievement because even though we're a transitioning district and not a modeling district, we still make it. So transitioning make district, districts make it. It's a good okay. thing. Yeah. Okay. As long as we aren't high need, we're good. Okay. Okay. And how many... Of those groups or those qualifications, do we have to make it in? Just one or all four? Technically one. Just one. Do we have a plan to roll this out with parents? Not yet. Um, we uh, are still rolling. <laughs> I mean, at least I'm going to be honest. Um, we felt like you needed the information. Each of our principals have had training on it, and, and they have um, some. I'll be honest, they've done some training within their buildings, kind of sharing some little bits of data through their site councils and through those pieces. Um, I'm already uh, booked on the docket, should I say. My, my nights throughout this year are pretty busy with some site councils that are saying, can you come do this for our, our staff? Mm -hmm. We've trained all of our building leadership teams in the district, so they all have the knowledge. Um, but it is, it's very overwhelming. And um, I just keep telling them, if you just say we're okay, then we're, we're then know we're all right, um, especially knowing that it's going to change. So um, schools have kind of built their own little plan as far as a district deployment. Um, our goal was to start here with you first. 
Well, I think, um, and maybe this really isn't the time for the conversation, but there are organizations that are trying to tell the story of schools, and it's not always positive. Mm -hmm. And I look at this, and it's complex, and mm -hmm. and so how how are we going to make parents understand that you know we're moving forward, we're doing okay when they're hearing another story somewhere else? And I think that's where we're going to have to be uh, good about uh, sending a clear message of what this really means. And I think some of that will come through the communications that as I work with Maggie and as we tell the story of our schools and that, um, that we are sharing that. Because truly, this is one little piece of data. There's a lot of things that say we have great schools in Olathe. And so we just have to continue to be good about making sure people understand this is one slice of the pie. There's lots of things that we have that are good. Well, looking through this, and, and, and as Amy said, I mean, it was a great presentation. <clears throat> a lot of information to try to digest and really understand. You know, as I'm looking through this and looking at the four different topics or the four different AMOs, mm -hmm. you know, I guess the part that, and again, knowing that we'll transition to something else in the future here, which makes mm -hmm. it even more complicated from that standpoint, it almost feels like when you said, especially when you say you only have to hit one of the four, it almost feels like we've almost stepped back a little bit as far as holding ourselves accountable. Um, so that'd be one of the things that I'd really like us to continue to look at and continue and press upon that while you only have to meet one of the four, that we are setting higher standards for ourselves. And again, we're judging it against ourselves and continue to move forward with that from that standpoint. I, I guess one of the other questions I had with that is just making a, a, a comment when you're talking about moving to the new assessments and waiting for the state board to make a decision on that. Mm -hmm. I guess it's kind of confusing when we sit back and look at reducing the gap that we have until 2017, 2018, but almost knowing that we'll have a different assessment before we ever reach that in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, I, it goes back to what Amy was talking about, is just that, that communication, the education to our, to our parents and to the community about how we are continuing to progress, even though we're, I'd almost say that this, does handcuff us a little bit. I don't. I, I, it really. I think it's hard to communicate this information out. But as if we're doing a very diligent job of saying, look, here's where we're at today. And again, we're not comparing ourselves to a lot of other right. districts at this point. But here's our standards where we want to go at, and we'll just continue to go on from there. I think that's going to be our biggest challenge. But I think that's also something that's going to be we have to be very diligent at. Absolutely. Because to Amy's point, there's a lot of people out there right now that. When you add this confusion, it makes it harder for us a lot of times. It does, and, and knowing that you've partnered in that new assessment piece, knowing that we're gonna have a brand new assessment that you can't compare to this one, yet you're gonna try to equate data. Um, I, think, I think it's gonna be a hard sell because it is so different. And knowing that those assessments are different that's really, to me, where the complexity comes. Because I, I will tell you, we will see scores drop with a new assessment. We always do. Everybody does. And we already saw a little bit of a drop this year. And the state is anticipating that we will see a drop because of the new assessments, because they're covering different content. They're in formats where kids are now having to write responses. Um, there's lots of different even assessment techniques. It's a new assessment system. All of our teachers are going to have to learn what's called the kite system. Um, you see we have all these little acronyms, but mm -hmm. um, so there are a lot of things that um, we have to continue to just be diligent with and and try to stay the course and, and get the information out. Well, and that, so. to your point, it, 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 one of my biggest concerns are the teachers. You know, mm -hmm. do they know which direction we're going in and how they do we do. Can communicate with them and say, keep moving the way we're doing. We're doing well. Keep moving in this direction, even though these assessments are going to change up on us. We need to keep telling everybody what a great job we're doing. They they do. They um, they know the curriculum. Um, Ms. Hermrick does a great job with that's out. People know what they're supposed to teach. Um, do we know exactly what that test is going to look like? No. Um, but if we're teaching our curriculum, then we should be okay. Um, so. Well, well, I, oh, go ahead. Well, I think we need to talk about the benefit to this system is that it allows us to set our own internal goal for excellence you know and um, it's it's focused inward because we know our students best we know our curriculum we know our students performance and we can set our own goal and to me the the flexibility of this system is it allows a district that has a higher number of students who are not proficient to set a realistic goal that allows them to achieve, mm -hmm. but doesn't force them to be compared 
to the rigorous performance that our students have. So, I mean, I think we have to help families understand a global picture of that, but then have them understand that we set internal goals for excellence. We, we always have, and we will continue to do that. And I think that's how we frame it. Well, and, and let's be very clear, we do not teach to the test, do we? This is Correct. just we a benchmark that, that shows our excellence or our needs for areas of effort. We teach our curriculum. That's right. Thank you. And then about the assessment, tell me again, two-thirds of the ex existing test and then a third was the new. The, mm -hmm. um, and the new didn't the, count. They that's were what I thought piloted I items. They and did not count. And you feel like it impacted our scores by a distraction or? It, it impacted our scores because there were fewer items. Instead of having uh, typically the more items, the greater the chance uh, for student. Okay. And some of the items that they pulled were very easy items. And so it, again, by when you pull some of those questions that are, um, and I shouldn't probably say easy, but they are, they were easy ones that kids catch get real fast. They're lower level questions. When you pull some of those out and leave the higher level questions, it does, we will see a difference in those scores. So. Thank you. Yeah. On the performance categories, mm -hmm. what are the rewards for moving up and what are the consequences for moving down and what do they do with the high need level schools? At this point, um, if you're a Title I school, you're held to a different standard than others and really the only difference is you could still be a high need school and be a Title I school, um, but until you um, are in the bottom 33 or the bottom 66 schools, um, there are no consequences at this point. Um, there are consequences in terms of, in the old system you had, uh, if you didn't make it for two years, uh, then you were uh, put on improvement. Um, in some of these, because we have six years to make it, we're still seeking clarity from the state that, okay, what if somebody one year doesn't make their target, but they still have six years to make it, what happens? And so some of those questions are still unanswered from the state that we're working on. So at this point right now, there are no ramifications in terms of the big picture for the state. Under the old system, if you if you didn't make it, eventually didn't the state bring resources in to help you? In the, in the old system, if you didn't make it for two years in a row, then you were on improvement. And so now, because there are four ways to make it, if you make it in one of the four, then you make it. And so you may not make it in one of those targets, but you still have to continue to work on that target, but you're not on improvement. At least that's what we know so far. They are changing still some accreditation things, and we'll see what that plays out. But um, I think Mary also brought up a good point that this is just one measure. And uh, for example, we're going to talk about ACT is another measure. It has national comparison data. And so we'll have an opportunity to look at more than two, these two slices of data. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons the state is looking even at ACT, gives a different comparison. So I think it's a really good to remember there are many pieces to that puzzle called educating students. And we try and look at all those pieces of data, put them together, the graduation rate, the attendance rate, the ACT, the AP, advanced placement scores, and putting all that pieces together. So I thought that was a good point too. <laughs> I think a comment would, in regards when you look at the targets, it's easy for um, us to focus on um, reducing the non-provision and reducing gap, the gap as we've been doing for many years, reducing the gap. But to the parents and to the to the community, they say, well, that's that's well and good, um, that's an admirable goal for the district to have. But what about my child? Uh, in, it may not be in that those other categories, but when we look at the the, the most important target to me is improving achievement, that API. Because as we move students from one category, if, if you move them from meets the standard 500 points to exceed standard to 750 points, that helps your API. So in essence, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to move the entire cadre up from, from one category to the next category. And the more students we can get in the exemplary category to get the 1,000, points, that's, that's how we're going to raise our API as a district. So I think that's important for us to communicate that to our teachers and our staff as well as our community and our parents, that we're concerned about every student because improving achievement across the district is, is really our goal. And by raising every student to the next category, it's beneficial to the, student, to the, to the district in, in getting that API number up.
with our building leadership teams, that's been a big focus, is to know that those points count and they, we need to look at all kids. Whereas before, in the old system, we really did kind of focus on just our, our high needs or at-risk kids. Now we get to focus on all kids. So it's a good thing. So. Thank you very much. All right, at this point, we will adjourn for our comfort break and return at 7 p.m. <clears throat>
you do the farmer's yeah. market about there about four days a week. You know that? Yeah, that's right. Four to five. Yeah. <laughs> Because you figure six hours of school and uh, it takes you to what, vacation and stuff. You can't take you uh, there every day. As these individuals are leaving, I would just like to extend my thanks to this group. The wealth of knowledge and experience that was up here tonight was really impressive. I know our teachers appreciate their support in the classroom and I just want to extend my personal thanks to your volunteerism. It's really tremendous. All right, we are going to move on to item 4.01, which is public comment. At each regular board meeting, the Board of Education reserves limited time for individuals wishing to address the board. We request that individual speakers limit their comments to five minutes. The clerk will monitor the time and notify the speaker when the five limit five minute time limit has expired please direct your comments to the entire board if a response is appropriate the president will respond or refer to another individual in an effort to respect the privacy we ask that speakers refrain from discussing personal complaints involving individual staff members or students those speaking are advised that public comments are videotape recorded for broadcast on the district's educational access channel and audio tape recorded as a matter of public record. Individuals addressing the board should come to the podium at the front of the room and state your name and address. We did not have individuals sign up prior to the board meeting, but if there's anyone here who would like to address the board, now is your chance. Seeing uh, no response, let's move on to our action consent agenda items. 5.01 through 5.05. Um, if there are any questions, we can take those now. Otherwise, I would entertain a motion. I would move to approve consent agenda items numbered 5.01 to 5.05 as presented. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Poland and a second by Ms. Martin to approve consent agenda items numbered 5.01 through 5.05 as presented. Ms. Hitt? Mrs. Felcher. Yes. Mrs. Martin? Yes. Mr. McCune? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. Mr. Poland? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Item 6.01 um, under action bids, contracts, and agreements is um, purchase of replacement vehicles for the high school. Questions, comments, or a motion? So I move to approve the low bid from Lang Chevrolet, Paola, Kansas, for five new vehicles at $35,872 each less total trade-in allowance for five current vehicles of $25,000 for a total purchase price of $154,360. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Shear and a second by Ms. Felter for re uh, purchase of replacement vehicles for the high school. Mrs. Martin? Yes. Mr. McCune? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. Mr. Poland? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Mrs. Felter? Yes. Item 6.02 is um, construction management proposal for the elementary school renovations. Questions, comments, or a motion? I would uh, move to approve uh, 6.02. Uh, motion to accept the construction management fee proposal for 20 elementary renovations from J.E. Dunn and Construction Company in the amount of $1,129,000. Second. I have a motion by Mr. McCune and a second by Ms. Martin to um, accept the construction management fee proposal for the elementary school renovations. Ms. Hitt? Mr. McCune? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. Mr. Poland? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Mrs. Felter? Yes. Mrs. Martin? Yes. And if I could real quick, just Mr. Thomason, refresh our memory on when all this work will be completed. And under budget. And under budget. 
Uh, our goal is to have all of the security, uh, secure entrances at the front doors and classrooms without doors by this time next year. Wow. That includes the, the four that have the major renovation? Not all, there's a potential that items such as flooring and corridors, some ceilings, some improvement to classrooms may have to go to a second year in some of those buildings with so much work. We're focusing on security at the front door, classrooms without doors by this time next year. In 20 buildings. 20 buildings. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. And Good your hair is already gray. <laughs> I, I started that way young. <laughs> All right. Item 6.03 is um, Elementary 35 Encroachment Agreement. I move to accept the terms of the encroachment agreement with Southern Star Gas Pipeline as presented. Second. I have a motion by Ms. <coughs> Felter and a second by Ms. Martin for the Elementary 35 Encroachment Agreement. Ms. Mr. Parker? Yes. Mr. Poland? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Mrs. Felter? Yes. Mrs. Martin? Yes. Mr. McCune? Yes. All right, moving on to item 6.04, the proposal for a potential sale of Mill Creek Center, the third offer. Dr. Daniels, I'd like to recuse myself. Yes, thank you. Mr. Hutchison, you have some information you would like to share with us. Uh, yes, I would. The board's received a lot of information over uh, the past couple months. And before you act this evening, I thought it was important to kind of summarize and, and point out the key factors uh, for your consideration. Um, Mill Creek has been preparing students for their future since 1867. That's almost 150 years. It began uh, with a, uh, the old Rock School. In 1926, uh, John P. St. John High School was built and has um, taken on additions over the years and various uses and ultimately was vacated in 2011. Uh, in 2013, this past summer, we completed work on our advanced technical center and vacated the vocational building on, on that complex. But at the same time, uh, we have alternative education programs that have now take, um, taken root in the annex portion of that complex. Currently, we're operating our step-up program and what we call our off-campus learning program. It's expanded virtual ed, SOAR, night school, and services to uh, students with uh, medical conditions. In addition, across the Mr. district- Mr. Hutchinson, while you're on that screen, could you talk a little bit about the step-up program? Because that just moved there, correct? Uh, it, it did. The Step Up program used to operate out of um, Center of Grace and has moved into um, uh, into the annex. And, and the reason that it, that we moved it there was uh, partly we combined that with our former homebound uh, program and offer uh, these additional off-campus okay. learning for for the efficiencies. We yeah, it wasn't yeah, it wasn't previously, step previously run by Greenbush, there you go. Uh, That's the consortium out of Southeast Kansas. Right. And uh, for, for a number of factors, uh, staff recommended that we bring that back under the Olathe School District. And I understand by doing so that there's a significant savings to the district by us operating it rather than that's correct. Greenbush to operate that. That's correct. All right. And that's part of the consideration for us to take over the program. To take over the program, yes. All right. How many students are in the program now? Approximately 160, I think, is what, what does the Step Up do? What is it? What's step the... Up is for uh, students, and uh, students, uh, as a term, can be adult. But your class has to have graduated, but you have not. And so uh, at any time, you can come back and work at your pace to uh, still get that high school diploma and so we have students who are you know 19 years old maybe all the way up through uh, into their 70s who come back still working okay. we also have a variety of other alternative education programs as you can see listed in uh, other spaces across the district that are outgrowing their current spaces and we have a couple programs that are under consideration right now they have not come before the board um, an e academy and a SOAR program for middle school students this graph just illustrates currently in their existing programs and sites, we have about 600 students in alternative education programs and the projections for the next five years is about a 920 uh, student population. So uh, the needs of alternative education continue to grow in our district. Another key consideration for you this evening is the components of the actual offer. The offer is actually from General Springs of Kansas City, not Faith Journey Church. I know there's been a lot of confusion about that, but within the offer, um, in the in the offer, uh, General Springs will bequeath the uh, everything but the metal building, the vocational building, to the church after the purchase. The offer calls for six hundred and fifty thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars down, and the remainder at a closing before August thirtieth of two thousand thirteen. Obvi obviously, we're past that date. Uh, so if any um, contract were uh, to be decided on, we'd have to up update that. 
The addendum also uh, calls for the district to upgrade the fire alarm system at an estimated cost by us of $25,000. And in addition, uh, there's an offer for um, some uh, uh, rental of the second floor of the annex building. In exchange, we would do all the lawn care and snow removal at an annual estimate of $13,000. This, um, this rent-free portion of the addendum is for five years, and it can be extended for another five years. Faith Journey Church has valued that at $350,000. However, because we have existing space for those programs, we really value that at zero because we do not have the need to go out and rent, and rent space for that program. Considering those uh, couple factors, in our eyes, the net offer is $560,000. And as you know, the recent appraisal has come back at $1,070,000. Additional assertions uh, in the um, offer are that uh, we would save $51,500 annually in, in keeping up this larger facility. Uh, that's assumed to be mainly our utility costs, and, and we provided that information uh, to the church. Um, it's, accurately, it's accurately based on the 10-year uh, average utility costs, but it's not been reduced um, for the reduced space that we're occupying in this space, and also that we'd continue to keep the annex at our own cost. Um, if we were to just run the annex and winterize everything else, what we face is $40,000 in utility costs each year. If we run the whole complex, we estimate that cost to be $70,000 a year. As uh, Mr. Parker had pointed out, in us bringing the Step Up program back to this site, and uh, uh, there are some synergies that are created uh, with the other programs, and we're able to save Beginning the second year, $250,000. We have some upfront equipment that we're purchasing and some software, but uh, beginning next year, we will run this uh, at a sa operating savings of $250,000 that more than covers whichever scenario of utilities and any of the lawn, uh, lawn care and snow removal at the site. With all of that covered, we believe by adding additional programs uh, to the facility, we can gain additional savings uh, on top of that. Another key consideration is the work that went on around bond 2013. During the fall of 2011, we started our CIP program, where we really analyzed the needs of the district. As that progressed, it, be, it was determined that we had a need for an alternative education facility in the district. And the need is for a central uh, location that was discussed thoroughly with the bond task force. And although they, though they agreed with the need, other needs kind of outweighed uh, that one at the time and it, be, it remained on what we call the parking lot list. If you recall, when we brought all the list of projects, that is on that list at a uh, price of $8 million. Th at the core of this need is really to have that center in a central location. While the planning for 2011, um, uh, prior to 2011, identified the need for a vocational program to move out of that complex and ultimately lead to the board's decision to place the property for sale, the work around this uh, updated CIP plan really shows that there is a definitive need for alternative education space in the district. So the board has several options that we, we've determined. Option one is you can reject the offer. You can keep this central site. You can replace nearly all of the uh, complex. Uh, this rendering just happens to preserve the historic front of the building and everything behind it would be replaced. That was priced out at a $15 million price tag. A second option that we explored was we can reject the offer, we can demo the vocational building, the metal building, to create additional parking, you can fully renovate the existing main building, you can do the whole complex in new HVAC, re-roof the entire complex, re-window the entire complex, and that's at 3.6 million. You can reject the offer, you can leave the building as is other than just add new boilers, don't try and get it the full infrastructure replace the roofs and windows, and save the renovations for a later time as we grow into the building. That's $2 million. A fourth option is uh, you can accept the offer. You can relocate and build a new alternative education center one day at an estimated cost of $16.6 .6 million because we don't have land for such a, in such a central location. Therefore, it's higher than option one due to the land costs. There's a fifth option. You can accept the offer. Uh, but it's below appraised value. Uh, so it's, it's up to the board to decide if, the, if that risks any fiduciary responsibility or not. 
And the sixth option is reject the offer and keep the property listed, but then you're also um, dealing with unaddressed needs for alternative ed space. Therefore, the, as you saw in our report, staff's recommendation is that uh, you consider option one and work towards uh, revitalization components that are listed for that site at $3.6 million and remove the property uh, from the market. As far as funding for those improvements, because I know it's the desire of the board not to keep it vacant for years as we look for that funding, we have a variety of avenues. We have funding from the 2007 bond issue in age facilities. We have 2013 uh, bond funds in age facilities. We have a potential sale of North Lindenwood, which avoids investment in that building as well as sale, uh, additional sale proceeds. All those together add up to about $5 million of possible funding uh, against this $3.6 million cost to renovate. Those are the key points in my opinion, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Board members. The, going back to the enrollment projections, we see a five-year projection of uh, uh, up to 920 students. Yes. And I did ask the question what the current capacity of the facilities are as is, and it was shown to be thought about 600. Correct. And so what are the thoughts about handling that five-year growth. Some of these programs run off hour or half day. Therefore, you can gain more capacity out of the building than just a full-time student at 600. If we were to take any one of these options where we actually would do something with the building, how quickly would we start doing something, renovations and making a change? What do you anticipate with that with? <laughs> 20 elementary schools getting changes and everything else. I would anticipate uh, realistically we, we'd be a year out. We'd want to get those. Uh, we have to still design, um, uh, bid, and stage that towards as we're finishing the work next summer, gear that facility up would be my my uh, estimate of that. Greg, do you agree? Year, year yeah. What would we do with the building between now and that year and a half before we'd actually... Uh, we would we would leave the systems on. Uh, we're operating the annex and uh, make sure that we maintain that building and and uh, gear up for our uh, changes to it. And meanwhile, where's the SOAR uh, population meeting now? SOAR is meeting at West. Source, uh, the SOAR program is mm -hmm. out at. Off the North, uh, Northwest Campus, PLC building has SOAR, and there's about 90 students there. And then we have some SOAR extended students that are now in the Mill Creek Annex, um, starting some of that online virtual learning piece that's part of the off-campus learning. But the majority of those SOAR students uh, operate out of the Northwest Campus on the PLC building. Okay, and that's our second largest program that would be in there. Correct. After step up, right? Correct. And step up, where will step up be meeting? Step up's there now. So they're in the annex operating now, very successful and pulled in lots of folks from that community uh, have walked in for enrollment. So going very well um, with just some paint and some nice pieces in that annex. We have lots of students operating there now. Dr. Dugan, um, do I understand that the Perry Learning Center would love to have the space if SOAR vacates the building? That would be correct. Oh, that's what I thought. Okay. They, they have a need. Again, they, um, it is a, a group of students uh, that needs more space just because of the type of instruction and their needs. And it's also a growing population as our district population grows. A small percent of our students need that services, but it's growing. Uh, and we're bulging a little bit in their half of that building. Dr. Dugan, for the benefit of the viewing audience and the public, so what, what, what kind of, stu what students are at, uh, being educated at the Prairie Learning Center. Prairie Learning Center is the name of a building that has Could two programs. Could you come over to the microphone, yep. please? Prairie Learning Center is the name of a building that has two programs. One of the programs is called Prairie Learning Center, a little confusing, and it serves our day treatment students. So these are students with severe emotional disturbances as identified through the special education identification process. Um, and they have a variety of emotional behavioral needs. The other half of the building is the SOAR program that is our alternative ed 
program mainly for high school students. What, what does SOAR stand for? Again, for the benefit of the public. SOAR Can, doesn't stand for anything. Okay. It is soaring to new heights the, and a oh, new system. Okay. <laughs> the, these, are, these, are, these are children that have been uh, suspended from school? No. no. So our SOAR program, it's a great question. Okay. Let me describe a student that would be in our SOAR program, and we have about 90 students. This is a student that just hasn't been successful in our large, traditional, comprehensive high school program. Um, and we always like to say they all have unique stories, so I hate to give a stereotype, but many of the students there have some school anxiety, school phobia issues, and they really thrive with a smaller group uh, of students, um, a better opportunity for deeper relationships with the staff members uh, to, again, get that same comprehensive curriculum just in a really different environment. So the, these students come from all over the district? They come from all over the district. What we found out because of that Northwest location, um, it's not as attractive to some students to clear the district to the Northwest. They have to get themselves there. And so that's why we love, of course, the idea of a central location. Okay. And so uh, all of our alternative programs um, are really benefit our community. HOPE, what does HOPE do? Our HOPE program is the, the program for suspended and expelled students. And so we have a very unique program in our district that uh, unfortunately we have students that violate our code of student conduct. Um, and we have to long term suspend them or expel them from their typical school campus. Uh, but we think their education is so important that we then take them to a different off campus location. About 50 students at any given time. Again, they rotate in and out. Um, and they receive full curriculum with student uh, with staff, uh, fully trained staff. I, and I think in some other districts, those students who are suspended from school are just on the street. They don't any other, they they don't offer an alternative program for those students. So. Most of those are served if they are served at home. Okay. At their homes. Mm -hmm. Choices. Choices is again a similar alt ed program. This is for an even more unique student that needs high high structure, even smaller classroom. Um, where, and where's, more adult where, where's, that, where's that program at now? It's, you're, I feel like this is awesome. It, it's uh, located <laughs> downtown uh, Olathe, and it's connected with the Adult Detention Center. It's actually where our um, probation officer's offices are. We have a small classroom space there, highly supervised, highly structured, small one-on-one -on -one I understand that there's, the, there's a discussion about us losing that space. As the county has moved to some different locations, they have kind of given us a, a bit of a warning that they may not continue to be able to give us that space. They may give up that current location and not take so us those, with them. Those students, we have to educate them because they're, they're even though they're at the, uh, the JAC, they're in our district and we have to educate them. Sure, and many of them are in that choices program, are Olathe students. They are residents of Olathe. There are kiddos that need a, a really different type of, of high school type program. And the AWE program? Our AWE program, and it stands for something, alternate work experience. These are our high school students with severe cognitive disabilities, and we provide them an off-campus work experience. Um, they do a variety of, of work for a local dentists or industry, uh, packaging some items, um, and they work out at the West Dentist site. So that's where they're at now? That's where they're at currently. Okay. Yeah. And then the, the Connect program? The Connect program is, uh, I, I don't think it stands for anything, and I, right now I can't come up with it. So, But we're connecting high school kids that are between 18 and 21 years of age to their community, but those programs currently sit at our high schools. I'm sorry? They're, so they, they are at our high schools. Two of our high school locations is where this program is currently, uh, and they are students that need to stay in school past the age of 18 due to their special education needs. So small groups at each high school. Uh, currently working on a variety of life skills type issues. And, off and finally, off-campus learning. Off-campus learning is a big umbrella. So this is kids that need something off the traditional campus. So it might be virtual learning. It's our students we've typically in the past called homebound instruction. That they, it's not that they need to be at home necessarily, but they need to not be at a large school campus for a variety of needs. So. So where are those, where's those, where's that program at now? Where are those students at now? It's in a bunch of different locations. So some go to SOAR to get just some virtual credit recovery. We're still going to some houses. We have some kids that we bring over to the West Dennis location. Uh, so it's it's uh, scattered. Great programs, all of them. So st so staff's recommendation is that eventually we would bring all those those programs to a central location. 
for lots of efficiencies, staffing, transportation, student participation, administration, have it centrally located, one administrator that runs all those programs that is not driving throughout okay. the district. Well, thank you for that. You know, and uh, th this is a completely different direction than where we were at. We were at a year ago <laughs> on Mill Creek. And Abraham Lincoln says it takes a, a man with a lot of courage to change his mind. And, you know, based on what staff has done here and, and the, the what you're proposing for alternative education, which frankly, we, this is the first time that we really looked at this. As a district, everything has been here, like, you, like Dr. Dukin was explaining to us, here, there, and yonder. And we're talking about bringing it all to a central location, um, which is a different focus than we've had in the past, entirely different focus than what we've had in the past. And uh, so that changes the dynamics of this decision. <laughs> for me, uh, from where I was, I've been here six, 15, 14 years, maybe too long, but, you know, and, and, I, and I have voted to put Mill Creek up for sale, but based upon what you're bringing back to us and what you're recommending here, uh, begins to make um, a lot of sense to me. So. Talking about the staff efficiency, other than administrator, share some examples of how the, the staff efficiency would work. You bet. With some of the programs we want to still offer the opportunity for these students whether they're coming in to do some online coursework and get a little support for that kind of the still comprehensive and the rigor of good content area if you're a SOAR student okay and you're not in a comprehensive high school but you're in a smaller group we still think you should have art experiences and algebra 2 trig and a good science class so we need content trained teachers if you can hire a, a couple full-time content trained teachers, they can help the students in the SOAR program, they can help the students in homebound, they can help the students in virtual learning. If we're all in the same location, we get enormous staff efficiencies, having more full-time staff serving all of the programs. Um, and so we're, we're excited about that because traveling teachers, you just lose time um, as they go, especially to different sections of the district. When you look at all these different, so there's a couple of these different options. So number one, obviously, is, 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 is large, where you just 15 million, but you've got option two and option three, somewhat similar from this standpoint. Um, you know, you've done a great job of representing and being able to repurpose this building and what we can do with it. Again, when, that's why I was asking the question about how quickly would we make some changes to it. I mean, um, understanding we've got some programs in there now are there some things that we would be able to do to be able to repurpose it quicker than a year and a half? Um, are there some things that we would we stage it out? Um, and then my last question of it is is really looking at, you know, if we were to, or if we do bring this to a vote tonight, are we picking one of these individual options? Or I'm, I'm, I have a hard time committing to one of these three without giving it a little bit more thought as far as if we're going to repurpose it, whether we tear it all down and spend two million, spend 3.6 million. I would like to have a little bit more time to talk about that piece of it anyway. Um, so I don't know if that's a way that we could repropose um, or if that was a way that we could put it to vote from that standpoint is that if we uh, reject the, the offer and, and just take it off the market and leave it at that at this point, knowing that we need to spend some more time to understand what that repurpose is and make sure that we fully have a great time to sit down and look at it and say, okay, what is the best possible use for this in the future? So I guess the first question is, what could we do immediately to make some difference and changes to this if we decided to keep this to ourselves? The, the structure of the building is extremely sound. The ancillary things could be started immediately. Re-roof it. Uh, it um, the metal building needs to be removed. We could uh, search out a um, somebody that would buy it for the metal. We have to remove the slab to create the additional parking. We have to do something with the heating and cooling systems. In theory, we could begin gutting because we have to get at the backbone. So there's a, you're, you're absolutely correct. This evening, I don't think the board has to decide ex the exact plan, uh, but we, there are things we could immediately start doing to tighten up the building and then um, uh, begin planning what does that renovation look like. So to answer the second part of that, um, y these options were just outlined by staff just to, to give you uh, literally some options. You can accept the offer tonight. You can reject the offer tonight. You can then decide whether you want to pull it off the market 
but then you don't have to go any further than that tonight. Um, if, if you say, I don't want to commit to waiting uh, throughout a year or, or want to start faster, or I want to talk more about the consolidation of programs, that's certainly a discussion that we can have going forward. But uh, I think tonight with an offer on the table, we need to either accept it or reject it and then talk about what we want to do, uh, uh, whether we keep it on the market or not. And that would be something that I, either we need to, and this just me talking at this point, either we need to decide that we're going to use this and move forward with it, not knowing exactly what we're going to do, or go ahead and, and continue either accept it or, or whatever the case may be. I, one of the, with, to Mr. Parker's point of this, you know, you're given a good plan. It sounds like a great idea to do something different, but what I don't want to do is continue to prolong this and saying, okay, whether it's the offer that we reject the offer because we might not be comfortable with where it's at today and waiting for a different offer down the road, I don't think that that's, I think we're at a pass where we need to make that decision and say either we, we're going to go ahead and repurpose this and use it for the school district and move forward with it or go ahead and just commit that we're going to sell it out because I think we've been taking this along for quite some time and, 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 and I think we need to make a decision one way or the other. But I'm, I, like I said, the biggest part with me is making that decision of what to do with it at this point. I don't know that we've had enough discussions about if we can do this and how quickly we can do it. Because again, I want to make sure that it's not something that's going to sit there for a year and a half in the condition. I know you're saying it's structurally sound, but in the condition, I want to make sure that we're going to use it to its fullest extent as soon as we possibly can. I think we've heard that same sentiment across the board that we want to see it used. It's right in the heart of Olathe. They've been doing beautiful streetscaping and renovations. Um, and all of our hearts have been touched by the plans of General uh, Springs and partnering with Faith Journey Church. Love to see you guys be able to implement your programs in our city. It's desperately needed. You have my heart. You can't have my vote because of the difference. I have a fiduciary responsibility. We have an appraisal at a million seventy, and you're offered the net effect, um, based on what you heard tonight, 560000 I owe it to our taxpayers, especially considering these other uh, programs that will be, I, ha I have the commitment, I feel, seeing that we have these options already, uh, this beautiful uh, building uh, drafted and all of these various options out before us. Uh, that will make this a part of our school district, not five years from now, but more like a year and a half to two. And actually, currently, we're using it for the annex portion, right? Correct. So um, my thoughts and prayers will be with your efforts. Uh, Kmart building is a great, <laughs> this is someone right here who thought of that, but um, I would be happy to, <laughs> I would be very happy to try to help you guys find a home for your programs. Um, and I appreciate all your work, John and Aaron, on this. I'd just like to make a couple of comments. I wasn't here a year ago, what this board decided, but uh, obviously uh, here today, there, this building has been in conversation for 10 or 15 years. I've been involved in this community through the City of Olathe, the Chamber of Commerce, and uh, it is an asset that the school has presently. They own it today. I see great value in the uh, central location that all of you have mentioned, obviously. Uh, talking about just travel times, I think uh, uh, Aaron brought that up. Um, travel times for our, our students, um, our parents, and also instructors, teachers coming to the central location would be uh, much more convenient. Again, it's a building that we own. It's something that we don't have to go and try to find a five acre parcel or a three acre parcel or three someplace that is centrally located. Uh, I don't know that you'll find that uh, for the price. I mean, you would for the price if you're willing to pay that. But again, it's an asset that we have and um, from what I hear uh, from staff and just visiting with um, people in the community, this building, one, it has a nice history in our school district, uh, but looking at the future of this building with the uh, programs and the people and students that it could serve long term, uh, not just this year, five years from now, but 10 and 15 and, and beyond, uh, I see great value in that uh, for our community and would like to see that. Um, in addition to what um, uh, Mr. Shear was speaking of, uh, whether we're accepting, rejecting, um, I would like just a little bit more time, but I, I like what you have brought forward. Uh, I, I guess one question I would have, and you did touch on it just briefly, is uh, the funding of it. Um, you know, 3.8 is, is uh, easier and more palatable than uh, 14 or 16 million. Uh, tell me again uh, how those funds you have uh, come up with those funds uh, in this current situation? Certainly. Um, you still have remaining funds in the 2007 bond um, in aging facilities. How much? 
Uh, I'd like uh, Mr. Thomas to finish off his projects before <laughs> I say exactly, but I estimated about five hundred thousand dollars. Five hundred. Okay. Then we have aging facility dollars within uh, 2013. And that's what we discussed this past spring before uh, all the, the uh, voters. We, and we have early. land budgeted in 2013, and we purchased all the land in a million one ahead of the game right now on land. That was that we've bought the, all the sites that were uh, and, and got good enough pricing that that is freed up to be allocated elsewhere in the categories, similar to what we did with the four projects this summer. We allocated um, to the next things on our list. Uh, there is a uh, potential sale of North Lindenwood Service Center, and uh, there are funds also um, uh, available for uh, repairs of that building if we choose not to sell it. But if we sell it, we have both the repair budget and we also have the um, sales proceeds. The Lindenwood building. Uh, of North Lindenwood Service Center. Okay. At about a million and a half. And then we also have, although thin, we could use capital outlay, but all those sources I just named add up to about $5 million against that 3.6. Okay. Well, I gotta say that, you know, as Mr. Parker and Mr. McKeon both alluded to, this has been on the board for a long time. And when I first got on the board, Mr. Parker and I, you know, we had no use for the facility. And, uh, we were excited to finally see it put on the market, but uh, my first choice has always been to find a use for this facility. Uh, number one, I live in that area. Number two, I went to school there. Um, number in 1867. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I think oh, yeah. <laughs> old stone. How about the old Poland establishment? Uh, but anyway, um, uh, my choice has always been to try to find a way to keep it but you know for so long we had no use for it we've discovered a use for it we've you know and uh it, it's a such a valuable uh asset to the to the city and to the school district that auditorium if we air condition it man what you know i think the city would love that because we're going to be bringing a lot of people downtown uh the same thing with the gym the gym is continuous use by the city uh so I think uh, just a tremendous, I'm, I'm just, you know, I, I, my heart goes out also to the church uh, because they came, put full uh, effort into finding use for it and finding a way to make it work. But I think this is a, a valuable asset for the school district. Um, I, I don't, you know, since this is, the, this is the week or the month, I said I have a dream. Uh, you know, the old three-story building that used to be on the corner of uh, Water and uh, Lula. Uh, very few people remember that. I say I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to find a way to somehow, you know, incorporate that into the growth that we might you know, experience on this facility. So, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm just very happy that we found a use for it, uh, and that uh, my definite recommendation would be to 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 take it off the market and proceed with finding use for it. But I agree with the other board members that we need to, more time to study what those potential uses are. So, Mr. Poland, is that a motion? You betcha. <laughs> if, if everybody else is done talking, <laughs> I will move to not accept the third offer to enter into a commercial real estate sales contract dated June 12, 2013, for the sale of the Mill Creek property. And in addition, staff is directed to remove the for sale listing of the Mill Creek Center property complex. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Polin and a second by Mr. Parker um, to reject the proposal for the potential sale of Mill Creek Center. Ms. Mr. Polin? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Mrs. Felter? Yes. Mr. McCune? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. All right, moving on at this time to item 7.01. Oh, let me just say one thing, Dr. Berry, um, as we prepare for our study session, let's make sure that we have discussion about the property. Uh, moving on to item 7.01, approval of board policy revisions. I move to approve the policy revisions as presented. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Shear and a second by Mr. Polin.
for approval of board policy revisions. Mr. Mr. Shear. Yes. Dr. Daniels. Yes. Mrs. Spelter. Yes. Mrs. Martin. Yes. Mr. McCune. Yes. Mr. Parker. Yes. Mr. Poland. Yes. Item 7.02 is approval of the appraisal study, and this is the appraisal for school and district administrators. I would move to approve 7.02 uh, to approve the school and district administrator appraisal process as presented. Second. Let's go ahead. Amy. Amy? Mm -hmm. I have a motion by Mr. McCune and a second by Ms. Martin for approval of the appraisal study process. Is it? Dr. Daniels? Yes. Mrs. Felter? Yes. Mrs. Martin? Yes. Mr. McCune? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. Mr. Poland? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. All righty. We now are at future action items. And so this is an opportunity for board members to um, direct questions to Dr. Barry or staff. Uh, Dr. Barry, uh, for the October board meeting, uh, I would like for Ms. Sill to maybe be at the board meeting and talk a little bit about um, the Head Start program, specifically why is it limited to 149 students and why do we have 55 students on the waiting list? And, the, and how does she go about raising the 20% local effort that's required by federal mandate uh, in order to, for us to get uh, Head Start dollars? And how is uh, Sequestra affecting a program? And um, one more is the budget, the current, bu I'd like to see the budget, no budget was there, is that a monthly budget or an annual budget? And maybe just for us to get an idea of the Head Start program, because we are responsible, we are the fiduciary overseers of Head Start. It wouldn't have to be a long presentation, but a presentation for us, because um, frankly, I'm, I'm just concerned about the 55 students on the waiting list and can we how, can we expand it? How can we expand it? If we can expand it, I understand that that's there's some federal mandates that direct that program. So it'd be good for the public to hear that as well as the board to hear that as well. We could explain all that. Thank you. There Thank you. Federal dollars that are funding that program. Right. Yeah. yeah. Any others? Can't wait to start talking about naming elementary 35. <laughs> I think it'll be fun. Too bad it's not a middle school, so we can start down my paper trail. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm so clever. Okay. Um, we're going to move on now to Im written information items. Do board members have questions they would like to direct to staff or Dr. Berry? I'm backtracking. And I You're apologize. backpacking. All right, just please do. On naming elementary 35, mm -hmm. just give us not just give us an update on what's being done on the boundaries. I know that's a question that was asked, and it's just for the education of everybody. Yeah, Dr. Dugan and her committee have already started that process. They've already been out and talked to site council members at the schools that will be impacted. That was the first step. Uh, they're actually putting together another group that will continue to, to work on this. But the uh, goal is that you will have the boundary process, I believe, at the November meeting, one month ahead with the details of it, to be voted upon at the December uh, time frame. So that way, next spring, early, when we start to talk about enrollment for the next school year, we obviously will meet for those in the Im impacted boundary area to go to the new school. Uh, so that process is in place with community uh, input, uh, staff input, um, and, and again, starting to progress. We'll hold open community meetings as well so that anybody can come and, and share comments. Thank you. So I'm kind of in the, in the same line that with just preparation from that standpoint, being that I've never gone through a boundary change, uh, being on the board to anticipate, to be prepared and to anticipate some questions and things such as that. Do we, have, do we have something that we've done in the past where we've reset boundaries and let's say you've got uh, sibling that goes there or doesn't go there do we have certain policies procedures and things that we've done in the past that mm -hmm. that we typically follow great question that we can make prepared yeah. and put out to potential change 
people that are going to have to make some changes and things such as that? Yeah, very good questions. And in my time in this district working on boundaries, I'm still bleeding in a few spots from uh, <laughs> being at those meetings. But no, there's very much an, an outline of guiding principles that have been set by this Board of Education that says, here's how we approach it. Here's how we, we go about setting boundaries. But there are some very specific details within that that says, if you have a sibling that's still attending a school, we're not going to split you up. Uh, if you are in that uh, last grade of the school you're currently attending, we don't force you to go uh, usually to that new school. There's usually a lot of excitement and kids want to go, but there are definitely some things in place that we can allow for some uh, grandfathering in. Uh, Dr. Berry, there are some guiding principles that we had um, established in regards to boundary ch changes. I think it would be a good idea for you to dis disseminate those to current board members since I think there's at least three board members that have not been through a boundary uh, change. It's a document that Dr. Dugan has updated and, and we pass out and we do use it, so uh, we'll get that so to That'd you. be good for board members to get yeah. that. And also, uh, in regards to Head Start, uh, Ms. Hill could talk about 8.06, which is the Head Start Certification of Health and Safety Screening Nick, when she makes her presentation. Okay. I'm just going to plug, on the website, we're down left side, featured items, click on Featured, Boundary Process for Elementary 35, Frequently asked questions, the community's already asking questions Great. and responding. Guiding principles, the process starts Great. to finish. Um, the works I did in the community of these schools out there are really on board to work through it. For you guys, a great solution. Um. Well, I think it makes a lot of sense to do the baby steps and do elementary boundaries before we have to do the high school so boundaries. And it's not like we haven't done a boundary change in the past. We've, I we've lost actually, track how, how many we've done. So. I th we've gotten better at it over the years. The, the last yeah. round of boundary changes went very smoothly, and I assume we'll, yeah. Community input is very valuable, that, doing mm -hmm. all this work in advance. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just have a quick question for Mr. Thomason. Why did we get this, and what will we be expected to do with it? <laughs> There'll be a test on Monday morning. <laughs> I mean, are we going to be making a decision on this information, or? Those were just for the three board members on the construction committee. And those are architects and engineer and okay. CMs who have asked to be put on our approved list. We will be discussing later. Well, the, it's, it's, it's just three of you received it. It's just the three on the construction committee. Okay. And these are, the, this is all I had to this date, so I thought I'd get them out to you so you could and start reviewing. this will be part of the discussion Monday. Um, it can be. And, and Greg will lead us through that, but we just thought you should have the information ahead of time. I appreciate it. I just, <laughs> I'm sorry I didn't get an email to you in time to let you know, but it's just the three on the construction committee, and those are the people that have applied to be on our approved list since the last time we reviewed and either added people to the list or didn't add them. Thank you. I'm just going to wait here for a minute because last time I moved ahead, then you backtracked on me. Yes, I'm done. Sorry. All right. Then by my list, we are ready for topics for discussion. Um, board members, do we have topics that we need to discuss? Seems like we've been doing a fair amount of discussing. Anyway. Looks like you're on, Dr. Berry. Okay, uh, just a few comments for you tonight. Today is the 16th day of school, uh, so it's running right along. But I want to take uh, the opportunity to publicly thank our teachers, our support staff, our administrators for a great start. Uh, and it's something that we do not take for granted. Um, with over 29,000 students, you can't do that. But again, because of staff, we really have a good start. It takes an awful lot to get the kindergartners placed in half day and full day classes, to get kids on the right buses, in the right lines to walk home, to have the right meal choices, to watch for allergies and reactions and restrictions that they have, to get kids in the correct class schedules and to redo those, to have the health records all in place and on file day one. Uh, new families to have family information so that we have accurate uh, contact information for all of our families. It just takes a great team effort and, and again, uh, we have a great staff in Olathe and we've gotten off to a good start. With regard to that, we have new staff members who join us, new teachers in the classroom and that's also something that we don't just leave to chance and that happens in some school districts in Kansas. They give them the key and say, we'll see you in May, good luck. Um, we have a wonderful orientation program that continues to support uh, new staff members to the district where they have after school learning sessions that they can uh, go attend on whether it's classroom management or use of technology or whatever it might be but a, a whole series of uh, advanced teaching and learning 
uh, courses that take place after school for particularly new staff to the district. Um, so again, wonderful effort that we have. I want to also mention, and many of you were there, we had the uh, ribbon cutting and the opening of the Advanced Technical Center, which is very exciting for us. Uh, again, Kathy Musgrave and her staff are to be commended for all of the work that they did. And I said in my brief comments, it's kind of like these teachers and staff members who are working full time, we said, oh, by the way, we want you to help, uh, help design this thing with the architects and with Greg, and, and then we want you to help move it over and get, get it in place and build part of it. And, but it's just been an outstanding effort, and it's a beautiful building that will serve kids for a long, long time. And the piece that we don't talk about very often, but those spaces are big enough and flexible enough that should we change programs you know, down the road uh, at some point, we can bring in other programs and it can be uh, uh, modified to, to fit any need that we might have there. I thought it was exciting tonight and we got to have a kickoff meeting with Heather Schoonover and the senior serving students, but uh, the, the group that not just volunteers but were able to attend this week, her meetings, Almost 150 seniors were willing to come uh, to park at North Lindenwood, which is a challenge uh, by itself, um, <laughs> to, to come in and, and have the kickoff for their school year. And again, uh, the number of hours you saw tonight that people come in, and, and it really is important and critical uh, to our school district, not just for what they, they do in terms of curriculum or the support, but it's the relationships that they have with some of our kids. That's very, very important. Also want to put a plug in for something that I really enjoy. You're going to see some of the best bands in this part of the country all in one location at the Old Settlers Parade on Saturday morning. Uh, it, it won't be raining, I don't believe. It'll be good and sticky probably, but it, it's a wonderful time where uh, Olathe comes together and recognizes its heritage, and the school district gets to play a pretty big part in that because everybody loves bands, and I'm an, I am of the understanding it's the longest parade in Kansas, mm -hmm. uh, but we'll have the foundation and other school groups as well as our bands participating in that. And then just a reminder uh, that you know two weeks from tonight we'll have a board study session, our annual fall study session that we usually have uh, where no action is taken, but it's a chance that we have uh, to discuss some more topics in depth. Dr. Berry, do we have an initial initial student count? I know the official count's not until the 20th of September, so do we know about where you we're know, at? We get it every Friday from Chris Grollup, but we try not to pay any attention to that because it really does go up and down. <laughs> okay. And and at this point, at this point, there are some groups that aren't even uh, reported yet. Uh, you know, it, it, it plays into our count the number of kids who are held in detention because we also, that's a, another alternative group we didn't talk about tonight, that we, we educate those kids who are in the juvenile detention and they come into our count. But anyway, it's all being sorted out. We know that we're going to be up. Uh, and right now I might guess to be in the 380 range, something like that. What we, would we put in our budget? Three. <laughs> Are you serious? He's not that good. It was about 415 maybe or something like that. <laughs> He's good, but not that good. All right. Basically, a third of an elementary school. It, well, yeah. Half, um, almost half, half of an elementary, you yeah, bet. Okay. Yeah. All right. And if you combine that with last year's, well over 1,000 kids in two years. Yeah. All right, at this point, I believe we need an executive session. Um, Dr. Berry, how much time do you need? I'd like to have 20 minutes if we could. And we probably need another 10, 15, I think. All right. Well, I'll cut like mine to, to 15 if, if you want to go 15. What? I'll cut mine to 15 if that helps and we'll go 30 minutes. We're good. We're fine. Okay. I'll move that the board adjourn to executive session for the purpose of discussing personnel matters of non-elected personnel and to discuss matters relating to employer employee negotiations and that the board return to a regular meeting at what time what do we decide 8 30. at 8 30 p.m in this room the executive session is required in order to protect the privacy interests of the individuals to be discussed and to protect the district's right to the confidentiality of its negotiating position and the public interest second i'm sorry who's second Hi, I have a motion by Mr. Poland and a second by Mr. Parker to adjourn to executive session. Ms. Hill? Mrs. Spelter? Yes. Mrs. Martin? Yes. Mr. McCune? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. Mr. Poland? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes.